So we are in our last section of the Lord's Prayer. As a recap, we went to our Father, which means our Father who, who promised to redeem us from slavery, from oppression, who art in heaven, who is sovereign in who is powerful to be able to do such. May your name be glorified. May your name be magnified. Hallowed be thy name. And the name of God will be glorified the most when his kingdom come and the will, his will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. When that day comes, there will be a big banquet. Give us today our daily bread. As, as the Jews ventured into the desert, God provided manna, daily manna. Give us today our daily bread. And we look forward in that day we're in, there will be a great banquet when God established His kingdom. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Only those whose sins are forgiven are able to enter the kingdom. Only, who sin, only those whose sins are forgiven are able to partake of the banquet. Us being forgiven, empower us to forgive others so that others may experience the forgiveness of God through us. Lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. Lord, as we wait, we pray that we may be faithful to you. Lord, on our own, we cannot do it. On our own, we're weak. On our own, Lord, we will fall. That's why we are thankful that our sins are forgiven, but we pray, we long, that you may deliver us from the evil one. That you may not lead us into temptation, for we are weak and we need your power. Now comes the last part of Matthew chapter 6, 13. When Jesus gives the disciples a vision on what is to come. And it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just meditating on that passage is really, really refreshing for my soul. My son, this whole week, because as you well know, I start preparing for the next message after the message. When I go home, I start preparing again for the message for last Sunday. And my son was just telling me yesterday, Dad, every day going to work, you're singing, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Because as I meditate on it, the more I wanted to praise the God. And, and, and the struggle for me in, in making this message today is this. I know I will not give justice to that phrase. I don't think any man will give justice to that phrase. No man will ever give a good, clear explanation of all the implication of that statement. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Ah, uh, Whenever I just think of that, 
I'm overwhelmed by what God has done. And this morning, I would like to get, I, I can only scratch the surface of that statement as I try to give a little light to that phrase. And as I was trying to clear my thoughts, I was telling my wife it's already Friday night. And I was telling my wife, I haven't written anything yet. Because every aspect that I look, I drown, to be honest. Every phrase I, I meditate on, it's too deep. I was overwhelmed with that idea. Thus, every day I was singing that song of worship because I was meditating on His Word. So I, I try to, to try to give you a glimpse of where this took me. And it all started to me in Genesis. And we studied Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It all started there in the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth. And, and we remember the six days of creation and, and we learned that on the seventh day God rested and commonly that, that idea that God rested is something perplexing unless you understand it in the eyes of a Jew on the eyes of the Jew that that story of creation is what? A temple imagery. Because in the temple, everything there symbolizes the universe, the cosmos. And the construction of a temple is exactly the creation account. The thing with a temple is that they built a building, if you remember. After building a building, it's a building, but not a temple. The temple, a building becomes a temple when what? When the deity is brought in. So they have, a, they, they have an elaborate ceremony. That ceremony is what? Seven days, exactly like a creation. But on the seventh day, the priest with his people will be carrying the deity inside the temple, inside the building. After all the pomp and pageantry, that building is now called a temple. Why? Because God now resides in that structure. So typically the seventh day, if you don't understand it in the light of Jews, is nah. Wala lang, he rested. But the seventh day really is the culmination. It is the apex of the story of creation. Why? Because on the seventh day, God rules and reigns the universe. As you well know, in the temple, when they bring the deity and it's now a temple, that's why the that's the reason why people go to temples. Because they believe that the presence of God is in there, ruling and reigning. That is the dwelling place of God. That is the place where He will rule and reign His kingdom. That's a, that's a concept of resting. Resting is not resting. It's, it's like saying that 
the the power of the president rest in Malacanang. You don't see the president there resting. The concept there is there he is ruling and reigning. That's why when God said on the seventh day he rested, that means on the seventh day he started ruling and reigning his order, the universe, the temple. What did God do on the eighth day? He did the very same thing. He was ruling and reigning in His temple, in His creation. So that's the imagery that God created. He created the universe. He created a temple. He created a kingdom. And on the seventh day, He placed Himself as the ruler. As the king ruling over that. Now the problem comes in Genesis chapter 3. Man sinned. A lot of times we think that when man sinned, what happens? Man fell. Right? He is now going to die physically. But few people realize that when man sinned, the whole universe became corrupt. The, the, the only thing God created that is, in, that is in His image and likeness is mankind. That is the highest thing that he created. The moment that man fell, everything fell with it. So in a sense, the kingdom, the temple is now turned tarnished. It's now defiled. And the story of the Bible is the redemption. Not of man per se, but the redemption of the kingdom of God. That is the big story. And part of the redemption of the kingdom of God is the redeeming of man. But with the redeeming of man is the redemption of the universe, of the kingdom, of the temple. That's why, go to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 19 says, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. All creation anxiously longing meaning the imagery there is a of a of a kid in a parade i remember santino when we went to disney in japan right and the parade was passing by i remember my son his neck is outstretched looking for the characters right that's the imagery of anxiously longing neck stretch out Hopefully, desiring to get a glimpse of Mickey Mouse. And with that focus in mind, everything is blurred. The whole creation is anxiously longing for what? The revealing of the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Us. When will that happen? Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then believers also will be revealed with Him in glory. When Christ returns, and man, the Son of God, will be restored, it is only at that moment will all creation be restored to its former glory. In the meantime, creation 
is in futility. Verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope, verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to the corruption to the freedom into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. The whole creation is not functioning according to the purpose of God. The king, the, the the imagery that God did, the creation that God gave, did in Genesis chapter 2 is not functioning. Why? Because sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, it corrupted the world. And now the whole creation, the whole world looks forward to that day that the kingdom will be restored again. <clears throat> and that kingdom will be restored again when Christ returns and restores mankind and when mankind is restored the whole creation will be restored and renewed that's why all through the Old Testament we hear prophecy of the coming kingdom of the coming king it was told to get to david in second samuel that your descendant your descendant david will establish a kingdom a kingdom that will last forever over and over we hear that theme and the one that will establish it in Isaiah is called wonderful counselor mighty God eternal father the prince of peace the Old Testament is all about the proclamation of the coming king who will restore the broken kingdom of God the kingdom that was broken because of sin and it has been prophesied throughout the Old Testament so when Jesus Christ came into the world clearly there will be a clash a clash between two kingdoms the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God brought forth by the birth of Jesus Christ we see that clash immediately on birth go to Luke chapter 2 please Luke chapter 2, we look at verse 1, 1 to 14. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitant earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary who was engaged with him and was with child while they were there the days were complete for her to give birth verse 7 and she gave birth to her son firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over the flocks by night. Verse 9. And an angel of the Lord 
suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and laying in a manger. And suddenly there appear with the, the angels of multitudes of heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When Jesus was born, the emperor then was Augustus. He was the head for the last 25 years. As you know, these empires, they grow through conquering nations after nations after nations until almost all the known civilized world was under the Roman control under Augustus. That's why he was called King of Kings because he controlled a vast piece of land. And because of that, he brought what? Peace. During the time of Augustus, there was peace. And that the power rested only in one king, in one ruler that was him. He had the ultimate power, he had the ultimate glory, and he brought in the peace. Unfortunately, that peace came with a price. He had to slaughter hundreds and hundreds and thousands, of, if not thousands of people who are against him. Anyone that is a threat to his power, to his glory, to his kingdom is put to death. That was the price. But little be known him, 1,500 miles away in a little town of Bethlehem, when he turned 60 years old, a baby was born in a manger in an unknown little town. That birth brought about the angels singing glory to God in the highest and peace to the people on earth. There was a new king. A young king born in Bethlehem. Representing a different power. Representing a different glory. Representing a different peace. This is now two kingdoms colliding. That's why in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, we read there, when Herod heard about the birth of this king, he was troubled. In fact, he wanted to kill Jesus. He tried. But this king is a different king. This is the word in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. When you look at 
Augustus Caesar, the glory there is different from the glory emitted by this baby in a manger in Bethlehem. The glory of Caesar was brought about by brute and force. The glory of this Jesus was brought about by grace and truth. That's why when this young boy grew up, his message is what? Repent for the kingdom has come. It's all about reestablishing the kingdom from Genesis. Repent for the kingdom has come. But the shocking truth here is this. Not only has the kingdom come, I am the king of the kingdom. And the Pharisee says what? Well, blasphemy. This is not true. <clears throat> That's why in Luke chapter 19, verse 37 and 38, it says, As soon as he was approaching near the de descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they have seen and shouted, Blessed is the King! And he did not rebuke them. He did not correct them. He did not say you are wrong. The disciples said, Blessed is, is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He came to be king. He came to establish a kingdom. As promised in the Old Testament. That's why the message of Jesus, if you study intently and clearly, revolves around the kingdom. He, we hear statements like, the kingdom is like a hidden treasure. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. The kingdom is like a yeast. The kingdom is like a child. The kingdom is like a pearl. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about Christ establishing the kingdom of God. In fact, he did establish it. Already, but not yet theology. As I keep on saying over and over again. Look at Luke chapter 17. They're asking, when is this kingdom? <clears throat> Luke chapter 17 verse 20 to 21 says Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming when will this come? He answered them and said The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed nor will they say Look, here it is or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. They don't get it. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, they do not hear. That's why they have a great banquet. That's why Jesus was always partying, was always feasting. That's why he was not fasting. Because he said, why would I fast? The kingdom has been established and I am the groom. Let us celebrate. But people were questioning, why is he eating with sinners, with prostitutes, with outcasts, with tax collectors, the chief of sinners? Why? But because Jesus is saying, because they are now part of my kingdom. It's because their sins has been forgiven. 
now they can partake of this great banquet with me here on earth. He was redefining how they view the kingdom of God. He was redefining how to be part of that kingdom wherein he is king. That's why he says, not all Israel is Israel. Not all the descendants of Abraham are descendants of Abraham. That's why he says, not circumcision of the flesh, it's the circumcision of the heart. He say you don't have to go to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice and go to the purity rituals to be clean and forgiven. You can be clean and forgiven here and now in my presence. Repent. Turn away from your sins and be part of my kingdom. Honestly, when I was going through this message, I really wanted to go deeper and deeper and deeper. The problem is, ah, this is never ending. I have nothing to say on Sunday if I keep on meditating on this. I wanted to look at the different parables. I wanted to show you how it is crystal clear in the Word of God. And as I mentioned, on his final week, honestly, to be really, really honest, every aspect of the life of Jesus points to his kingship and establishment of his kingdom. Every single aspect. Amazing. That's why, as I mentioned, in his last week here on earth, it is exactly the same process and protocol of an earthly king being enthroned. An earthly king that would be enthroned would enter the kingdom with shouts and praise. Look at Mark chapter 11, please. Mark chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. Those who went out in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is this coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. They were proclaiming it as Jesus was about to be enthroned. And like any king, the king to be had to be anointed with oil. Jesus was anointed with oil from that woman who took and wipe the feet of Jesus with oil, expensive oil. Now the king to be would have to sign the covenant, and Jesus established a covenant through the Lord's Supper. After establishing the covenant, the new soon to be king would have to be dressed in purple clothes and place a crown, Jesus was dressed in purple clothes and was crowned the crown of thorns. And ultimately, this new king to be would be enthroned in his palace. He would be risen up to that status, and Jesus was risen up on the cross. Not only for the forgiveness of sin, but for the proclamation that He is King of kings and Lord of lords, the kings of the Jews. 
the kings, the king of the new kingdom. That's why at resurrection, Ephesians tells us that in chapter 1, that Christ at resurrection is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven at this very moment. How does it look like there? Go to Revelations chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. John is speaking. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a gasper stone and sarges in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garment of golden crowns on their heads. And people say that these 24 elders are the 12 tribes of Judah and the 12 apostles. Verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, full of eyes around and within. And the day and night they did not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And when the living creature gave glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell down before him who sits on the throne. And will worship him who lives forever and ever. And will cast their crown before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will, they existed and were created. For all eternity, people are worshiping God. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And one of the most important word in the passage I read is verse 11, the word because. Meaning what? People are worshiping God by their own will. They have concluded who God is. They, con they have concluded what Jesus Christ has done. You created all things and because of your will, they existed and were created. With that knowledge, they can't help but worship the king of kings. I've been asked in the past, Bobby, will I recognize my dad, my mom? Will I, will I feel sorry for this thing, that thing in heaven? My belief is this. You will be at all with Christ. For me today, and you know, mind my example, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not joking, if I step out here and I saw entering Pogs, Isco Moreno, I don't see anyone. I, my eyes will just be on him, wanting to approach him, wanting to get a selfie. There might be a crying girl there, there might be something, there might be a lot of people, but everything will be black. 
because of what is in front of me. The Lamb that was slain. The glorious God. Chapter 5. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open and break the book and to break its seal? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. No one. Not even one. Not even Moses. Not even Abraham. Not even Elijah. Isaac. Jacob. No one. Then I began to weep. Greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so, that, so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the thrones and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he began, and, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seal. For you were slain, you purchased for God with your blood men from every time and every tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom, a priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads of millions and thousands of thousands saying with one loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and earth under the earth, on the sea, in all things in them, I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Then one day that king who sits on the throne will come to reestablish his kingdom here on earth to reestablish the new Jerusalem the new temple which the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 no longer any sea what does that mean? evil will not be present anymore and it will be called the new Jerusalem. And in that new Jerusalem found in Revelation chapter 1, <coughs> 21 and 22, God will now reside among men. He will dwell. That word dwell in Revelation chapter 21 is exactly the same word used to Jesus. He dwelt among us. And in that kingdom, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, 
1 verse 4, And He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. Because all things are new. And he says in verse 6, It is done. It is finished. Like the shout he did on Calvary. It is done. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega, the beginning and the end. Then John said, I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. In Revelation, it says, He will be declared King of kings and Lord of lords. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of His Christ. And He will reign forever and evermore. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. And that is how the Lord's prayer ends. The reestablishment of God's kingdom. Ruled by the lamb that was slain. And in that kingdom, people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation will sing, Holy, holy, holy are you the lamb that was slain. To receive all honor and power and wisdom. This is the kingdom of God reestablished. What was broken in Genesis was rebirth in Revelation. That is the ending of the Bible. So, when the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse, verse 13, For thine is the kingdom, that is what's in view. That kingdom that God will establish as Christ, as the ruler here on earth, for thine is the kingdom and the power. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. As mentioned in Matthew 28, verse 18. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how the Lord's prayer ends. With a marvelous shout for the longing of the reestablishment of God's kingdom, God's power, and God's glory. That's why we pray and cry out with our forefathers, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. That is our prayer. That is our desire. As we look forward for that day. Thus says the Lord. Let's pray.